good afternoon and welcome to everybody who is attending. And uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, Market in Liverpool and ourselves in the bid, just delighted that so many of you are attending today. And hopefully this hour will be a useful hour for all of us. Really, it's for us to get feedback from the industry uh, because, you know, at this moment in time, uh, we're all living in this world, which is totally strange. Uh, I don't know how many times I've used the word unprecedented, but it is. And we have to remember at the center of this is a worldwide pandemic. So we're doing this for one reason only, that's to protect people's health. And as we know, it's to protect uh, our NHS and also to ensure that um, as we can come through this pandemic in as good a state as possible. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, I would just like to thank everybody who's, who's playing their part by staying at home. We would all love to be out and about and uh, back into our lovely city, and we will be as soon as we can. But today, uh, I think for us, it's just an opportunity just to talk through what is happening. So we all know that from early middle of March, uh, when the government asked for those who, uh, particularly in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, to close businesses and those who could to work from home, we have done that and footfall has fallen. Uh, uh, if anybody looks at the footfall figures, you will see that footfall has fallen by about 85% year on year. And at this moment in time, it is running it in the tens of thousands as opposed to the millions that there used to be in this city center. So everybody's doing the job that they need to do, but clearly there are key issues about how do we protect the economy because the visitor economy at the center of the city region is one of the driving forces and it has been one of the driving forces for recovery. So that's, that's the situation at this moment in time. Elven and the visitor economy have been in place and have been operating uh, on a day, with daily calls and also weekly calls as we're seeking how we can protect the economy and how we can start planning for recovery. So if I just pass to Donna really just to pick up on retail and, and particularly the impact on Liverpool one. I mean well the impact thanks Bill is um, is starkly evident. Um, you mentioned their footfall. Um, it is non-existent. There are no visitors into uh, Liverpool one, the, the, the city centre and that's exactly how we need it to be. Um, everybody's gone to great efforts to ensure as you say that people stay home and stay safe. Um, we're going to face some tough times and there are some very tough questions that we need to be able to um, answer and there are no straightforward answers. Um, this period that we've seen over the last uh, few weeks has very much been about a period of survival for businesses um, as they go into lockdown, as people are told to stay away. Um, and I guess the million dollar question on everybody's lips is, um, what when will Liverpool's visitor economy be back open for business? Um, what will um, the future look like? And I think what we're working with now is how do we start to look ahead and how do we start to establish a new normal? Um, we know that life won't go back immediately to being how it was. Um, we ask ourselves the questions, how, how will shops operate? How will people move around public spaces safely? And I think that certainly the work that's gone in over the last few weeks has been lots and lots of discussion, um, both across the city region and further afield as we engage with similar organisations across, um, you know, the whole of the country, um, is to start to try to identify some best practice. How do we move slowly out of lockdown? Um, and I think that will very much be on, a, on an incremental uh, stage. Um, we're asking ourselves the questions, um, what, what will shops look like? How will they operate? And the one thing that we have to be absolutely focused on is how we um, live with coronavirus because it's not gonna go overnight. We'll be living with it for, for many, many months. Um, and our aim has to be to try and um, work with new safe distancing measures um, there's a number of scenarios that we are looking at in terms of how we can support um, safe movement of people um, both around the city centre and to work with those businesses to support people movement safely in and out of um, various businesses, uh, shops, bars, uh, restaurants. Um, 
opening times when will people open not not just when will they first open their doors to the public but what will opening times look like um how do they manage that knowing that we will have a reduced footfall visitor numbers we we accept we know um will decline but actually what we will see is we've very much got a role where we have to help people to establish some degree of normality in their lives and i think if that can be done safely that has to be our focus um, allowing people to establish that new degree of normality in their in their lives but it's very very early stages so how we do that is taking a lot of work a lot of thought a lot of consideration and a lot of consultation this certainly isn't a time for us to be working in isolation we have to pull together we have to collaborate uh, and we're learning we're learning all the time we don't have the answers but we have lots of um, different thoughts different suggestions different scenarios that are being played out at the moment will we be looking at a one-way system of footfall traffic around the city centre how do we manage people in through one exit and out through the other um, we're seeing some of that best practice starting to roll out we, we see we've seen it throughout at supermarkets how do other shops and outlets start to learn from what is working and what hasn't been quite as effective but what we have to do is to work with those safe distancing um, guidelines so that we can get back to a degree of normality Thanks, thanks, Donna. I mean, clearly, from a retail perspective, we uh, in the in the city centre we have had a uh, an economy that has uh, that has booked the trend, obviously, with the increased footfall year on year and uh, reduced uh, in terms of vacancy rates. So it's clear that, that that has been a delicate balance, and that clearly, as we move forward, planning to open up shops and planning to open up retail. Is going to be right at the forefront, working with the key retailers in the city. In fact, we're working with all retailers, moving forward as quickly as we can to get shops and premises open. But part of this will also be about how do we get people reassured that the city is safe, and that's part of the recovery planning that is going on at this moment in time in the city centre. Can, can I turn to uh, Paul Askew from a point of view of one of the restaurateurs in the city? Um, we know that you've been doing a lot of work with restaurants, particularly uh, you're at the forefront. You, you, when, when we have social distancing, which we, we know we're going to have to experience, how will you as a restaurateur carry out your business? Because you need close contact. You need that because that's what restaurants are all about. It's about that social aspects of the great quality restaurants we have in Liverpool. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks for having me on, Bill. I think... Um, the big, the big thing moving forward is, as we all know, hospitality by definition is a business where we gather together, we celebrate together, we chill out together, have a coffee, a wine, a lovely meal, whatever it is. And for suddenly uh, to be confronted, you can see the tables and chairs in the background at the art school there. You know, I, I've been in there looking at my own scenario, but also at many other people's. What do we do if those tables have to be two meters apart? And so you know looking at it from my point of view it's you know you remove about half about maybe 40 percent of your tables um how many times are you allowed to interact with each table in terms of pouring wine um you know our waiters and and, and service team are, are, are basically it's about experiential visiting and dining with us so whether it's a wine flight or a tasting menu the number of visits to each table is is going to be very very different and and as donna said you know we have to get used to living in an environment now that is going to be covid friendly for many many months ahead until a vaccine uh, is is nailed down and and you know the, the the impact on hospitality is huge because we're probably going to be the last to reopen um we're being asked to reopen uh with half capacity or less um obviously there's concerns about uh, what the economy is feeling like, what the, what the guest confidence is like. Will they come out? Will they spend money? I think there'll be an initial honeymoon period where everybody wants to go a bit demob happy and we get a, a few drinks and a few nice meals and then maybe the economy says we're not going to spend as much and, and, and pair back. So this this is where, you know, as, as hoteliers, restaurateurs, cafe owners, bar owners, 
we've tried to get together and really get into the government in terms of local and central and find out exactly what care packages are available. Otherwise, there will be, uh, you know, a very, very different landscape in terms of hospitality. And we'll see lots of people disappearing, which is exactly what we don't want, uh, because it's at the heart and the core of what Liverpool is and the identity of Liverpool and the visitor economy of Liverpool. So, you know, we're known as a, as a great city to come and have a great time and eat and drink and party. Um, and we want to be ready for that when, when this is um, starting to come to an end. But I think, you know, all is not lost. I think what I would urge colleagues and friends and, um, and people within the sector to do at this moment is be creative. You know, we're, we're, we are a creative industry. We're looking at different price points, different menus, uh, possibly some delivery services. You've seen some great initiatives, Liverpool Independent Delivery Service, the, the guide have got a little... Um, a delivery directory where you can find out which which restaurants are bringing things out for you and you know the, the city is pulling together and you can feel our, our hospitality community doing that all the time but we have got to be realistic we've got to help each other you know landlords have got to help in terms of lease structure uh, the banks have got to help all right yes the loan system is starting to ease now but you know it's about banks being able to allow landlords to give rent free periods and not be aggressive and there's many many more initiatives coming forward the rate raise the bar is one of the one of the big ones of course for the uh the rateable value uh, being lifted from 51 to hopefully 100,000 because there are so many businesses that don't qualify at the moment so that there's tough times ahead but i'm 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 sort of uh rolling with the punches and being quietly optimistic and and saying we will come out of it together and, and we will be a, a happy joyous uh, party town again I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea where we're at. Yeah, but Paul, you, you lead a group of uh, restaurateurs in the city. Obviously, you're speaking to them on a daily basis. Yes. Is that, is that the feeling across the restaurant sector in the city? I, th I think y y you've got every emotion going on at the moment. We, we all feel that um, there's a, I refer to it as this fog has descended upon us as we try to come out of survival mode. Um, and work our way through the financial challenges and and finding some stability i mean you know as each week passes each day passes it moves so quickly but you're quite right there's a lot of people um at our at our sort of hospitality association whatsapp group and beyond that that are feeling like you know w is it actually worth reopening is it worth just furloughing and, and stopping everything and reopening when the vaccine is discovered and maybe look at spring next year now, obviously, we've all got our own challenges and our own individual financial models and gearing. And I, and I wouldn't expect for one minute to say to people, oh, no, you must carry on if you don't think it's worth it. But what I would say is, you know, we, we have to try, don't we? We have to try and reinvent and we have to be, be creative and not wave the white flag. Um, we can't let this beat us. You know, it's no different than any other challenge in, in, in business, except this is on, you know, apocalyptic scale i understand that but you've still got to be brave you've still got to show the courage and the determination to get through but there's a lot of worried people out there for sure Bill. okay thanks paul uh, the, there are uh, questions coming through and we will respond to those questions uh, towards the end so there are please keep your questions coming through and use the chat function for that if i could just turn to stephen stephen hesketh uh, from liverpool Hot Hotelliers Association, Liverpool Hospitality Association, and clearly from the Richmond and Sleepy Love uh, here in Liverpool, you are also right at the front uh, of this at this moment in time with the impact on your own businesses. But you're also very aware of those issues that, that you're raising nationally through UK hospitality, but also through your direct letters to, to the Chancellor. Can I ask you to come in on this point, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can only but echo a lot of what Paul has, has, has clearly said. I think from a hotel point of view, uh, obviously in the city right now, you know, 85% of the hotels are shut and, and those that are open tend to be the, the service department led operators that are supporting NHS, vulnerable people uh, and the like, etc. So, you know, there is, you've only got to read SDR reports to say that there's, there's very little open, uh, so to speak, and those that even are, are uh, running at low occupancy. So the Richmond is open and operating. We are housing NHS and some vulnerable um, uh, staff, etc. And, um, you know, it's a different, um, uh, totally different hotel. The whole food and beverage operation is, is, is shut down. 
uh, social distancing practices have had to come into place. You know, it really feels like a whole different style of operation. Wider challenges um, is everything Paul's sort of saying, you know, we've got, we're, we're operating with 10 staff out of, we have 75 staff in the Richmond alone usually. So for that to be down to 10, uh, myself included, we are very much on the operation. So the, the daily tasks of the inboxes and the res calls and the customer uh, care uh, of, of our residents is at the forefront. But definitely you feel as though standards are almost substandard because you, you, you don't have those full F&B operations uh, running, etc. From a wider hospitality association, yeah, we've been very uh, proactive uh, today. Uh, a letter has gone to the Chancellor, uh, which we put on to our uh, Twitter site for everybody else to sort of see, really driving home, uh, you know, five or six key challenges, as, as Paul's already referred to, it's raised the bar. Uh, there's other ones in relation to ensuring that from a furlough point of view, that even there's a sector specific uh, view on this, that, you know, hospitality first in, last out, uh, we really need to see that our teams are looked after and that the furlough does allow us to do that because specifically when you bring it back to Liverpool, which is such an event driven city, you know, we won't have the football nights possibly for the remainder of this year. We, you know, the big conferences happening at ACC and alike, again, most have postponed into the new year, etc. So that dramatically hits every hotel occupancies um, across the whole city and, and region. So there's real tough times. So the chances of your full hotel team coming back the day somebody says, right, let the hotel open uh, is highly unlikely. So a phased return is likely to happen and, and we need the government to support, certainly from a furlough. I mean, that's massive, massive for us. Okay, thanks. Thanks on that, um, Stephen. Um, there was one question about the football season restarting. And I know Paul Askew has answered July the 1st. I would just add that that's your best guess at this at this moment in time. Yeah, it is it, a little bit of inside track, but but that's what the, the has been mooted by the FA, and it and it's going to be behind closed doors apparently to finish the season. That's yeah. the rumours. Yeah, yeah and, and clearly everybody is trying to finish the Premier League season as quickly as possible. Uh, it's a big a big issue, particularly a live issue here in the city, but clearly it's all dependent upon health as well. But and uh, so we will know clearly as soon as they can open. In fact, Richard Kenyon was due to be on the call today, but sadly, uh, Richard had to had to, to uh, cry off at the last minute because of uh, the ongoing discussions with the Premier League. Thanks for that. Um, the, the, the chat function is still available, as are the Q&As, and those questions are being answered live. And if I can hand across now to Chris Brown, uh, to look at our second section, which is around culture and events and brand Liverpool. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, so I think just to give a bit of context to this before we get into the debate, um, as uh, I think everybody now, I think is beginning to realise the hospitality and tourism sector is going to be one of the slowest to come out of this uh, recovery lockdown once we, once we get into that phase. Uh, and I think one of the challenges we have in that space is to try and uh, come out of the recovery uh, as fast as we possibly can, as coordinated as we can, and in doing so, I think address some of the issues that have been created through the survival phase, where uh, it's been difficult sometimes to get the liquidity required to businesses fast enough. Uh, I think there's no two doubts that from a, an ML perspective, in terms of audience development, uh, there, there is a very clear path there that we've got to win the hearts and minds of our local audiences first. Uh, we've got to get our local residents to feel confident and safe about entering the city again. Uh, so I think the health narrative around that will be very important. From that, we can hope to begin to position the opportunities around the regional and the, and the wider domestic audience. And international, I think, will be uh, a, a fair distance away because every single country will be looking to rebuild its market. So I think in this conversation, I want to kind of first initially probably go to, to Claire McColgan first in, in the context of Claire, the, the recovery plan for the city will be a really critical one. And, and where do you see that at the moment? And, and where do you see the hospitality and tourism sector within that? And what new ideas could we potentially come forward with to, to exit this uh, a, a very strong city? OK, thanks, Chris. I mean, I think it's really interesting. Well, it's not interesting at all. I think our world fell away um, over three days. 
um, about five weeks ago and I've never cancelled an event. I've cancelled one event in the whole time that I've been in Liverpool in the last 20 years um, and suddenly we're cancelling all of them. So those events that bring joy, bring laughter to the streets and are all about bringing people together aren't, aren't the events um, that we can be thinking of at this moment in time for, for obvious health reasons. I think one of the key things that we did at a city, and I'm really proud of this, is we got we got funding out to our cultural organisations very quickly. So we support um, about 35 cultural organisations and we were very quick within a two or three weeks to get funding to them so that they could start to really plan and to really think about um, one, how they survive this, and, uh, but also how they then recover. Um, because again, that sector will be, Laura will talk about this more, but the sector will be last, you know, theatres, concert halls will will be last because of the, the very nature that they are about being next to each other and enjoying a shared experience. I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a couple of other things that we need to think about in terms of sectors and, and, and how we support them. And one is around the event sector. So while um, the football, the football private sector companies, the city, we put on major events, there is a whole supply chain within that that is really badly affected by this. So whether it's the security firms or whether it's um, logistics companies or whether it's people that put up stages, there's a whole supply chain that we need to make sure that we're supporting as a city as, as we move forward through it. Um, the other big issue, obviously, that we have in terms of in terms of a city is people coming in to see work. So whether that's people coming on, on cruise liners or coming in on coach parties, it's probably quite likely that older people are going to be um, sheltered for, for quite a long time. Um, in terms of the city, we are very clear that the city centre has got to be our priority. We have built the city in the last 15 years around the visitor economy, around great content, amazing content that's grown, real quality of work. And we've got to make sure that we start to rebuild again. And we, we've done that before. I mean, for those of you who are as old as I am, when we started doing thinking about European capital of culture in 2000, we weren't we weren't even thinking we could we, we could be shortlisted, never mind win. And then we created a plan that was over eight years that was to build us to the position that we were in in 2018 and 2019. So we will do it again. We're building from a much stronger base. The fact that you're all listening at the moment, the fact that we have kind of 15 people on a panel, the collegiate nature of how this city works in crisis will absolutely stand us in such good stead as we move forward. But we have got to concentrate on rebuilding when it's safe to do so we have got to bring people back to the streets of this city we have got to be very aggressive in our marketing we have got to concentrate really hard on making sure that the city center is a priority because if you look at hope street you know and paul talked earlier i kind of look at the kind of regeneration if you like of the royal liverpool philharmonic and then how the kind of businesses and the, the hotels have kind of grown alongside that over the last 10 years. So we've got a real job to do to make sure that one, we can carry on creating quality work in a very different environment, but two, we don't let our imaginations be stilted by the fact that for the last 15 years, it's all been about the numbers. It's been about big crowds. I've got giants, you know, a giants poster behind me. It's been about big crowds coming in the city, spending lots of money. But also, I just want to end with it's about more than that now as, as well. It's about how we as a city embrace our citizens to come back into the city centre as well, because there will be a big confidence building that we will have to do as a sector to make sure that people feel confident about coming into the city centre to shop in Liverpool One. And I think a lot of the work that we can do in the cultural sector will be around building that confidence back. And we've got to remember we're building a city. We're only, we're, we only host things, all of us. You know, we're hosts. The next generation will be living here and we've got to make sure that we kind of create a city for that next generation as well and don't lose that kind of absolute passion and creative thinking and outward looking face of this city during this time. And I think it's hard when, when we're all in the situation that we're in at the moment. OK, and just one <clears throat> ancillary question there. Uh, a, lot, a few questions coming in around uh, the cruise market. Uh, and yeah. the impact of that, and obviously with the <clears throat> great intentions and vision to to build the cruise liner terminal, what, what what would your message be to those who you know make a you know develop a lot of their livelihoods around the cruise market? Well, we've got to wait till the cruise liners start back again because it's not in our control. So the industry, as everyone knows, is huge, but we don't control the cruise industry. We were, we are very well known within the, Angie Redhead, who lots of people on this this call this this conversation will know is incredible and she is working exceptionally hard she's running she's running the food hub 
<laughs> as well, just to be really clear. But she's also working exceptionally hard on making sure those cruise liner operators, when they are up and running, know we're open for business. So it's, we, I absolutely get how important the cruise liner is. It's transformed a huge amount of the tour operators that are probably listening to this, but also the attractions um, that, that that benefit from from, from those liners offloading their people into the city um, but the cruise liner industry is as everyone will know is not in good shape at the moment and there will have to be a big national government conversation but I think also a world conversation about how that industry recovers as a whole but we are ready and we are waiting and we have not lost our ambition around cruise liners. Okay Claire that's great. Laura if we could come over to you now I mean I think probably in two contexts you Laura one and you, you're, you're obviously chair of the sub-regional uh, city region Visitor Economy Board, and obviously, clearly, you have you know very strong assets, and uh, it doesn't. It seems a long time ago now, but the, the that the, the terracotta warriors and all the great things of that board, they seem uh, seem a long time ago. Hopefully, those days will return. So maybe from your perspective, Laura, what your your two takes really in terms of the uh, how you see things for the national museums landscape, and also in the context of the work you're doing at a Visitor Economy Board level, uh, just some perspectives on that, if you could. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, from a National Museum's Liverpool point of view, I mean, like everybody else, we're shut at the moment. We are doing some scenario planning at the moment about when we can be reopened. And as Claire says, within the cultural sector, um, that's going to be quite split in lots of ways. So our theatres and our major events and our music halls and all of those kind of things probably will take a lot longer to reopen. We are actually hopeful of getting the museums open slightly earlier than that. Um, we're big buildings. We can, we can impose social distancing in some way. Uh, our challenge at the moment around that is um, whilst our supermarkets are doing a brilliant job on social distancing, we don't feel that that's necessarily the right thing for our museums. We want our museums to be places where people can come and explore, can come and spend time with their families, can, can wander around and take an inspiration in whichever way they want to. So kind of one-way systems and, and lines on the ground kind of go slightly against that. Um, but our priority is around safety around that. So we've got a group working at the moment around how we could reopen the museums with social distancing in place in a safe way. Um, the reality of that probably means with a lot less people in the building, which actually from a visitor point of view might be lovely <laughs> because you'll, you'll get to experience the museum with half the number of people getting in your way. Um, so that could be a real positive for some of our visitors. Obviously from a financial point of view, that's not so great for us as a business. Um, and that's the balance that we need to play out. And I know I've been on a call this morning with some of the other arts organizations. I know Tate are having similar conversations. Um, you know, the blue coat will be in a similar place, but the theaters will be much later down the line on that. Um, from National Museum of Liverpool point of view, we're fortunate in lots of ways in that a very large percentage of our visitors are Liverpool city region visitors. Um, particularly at certain venues, we have very high percentage of local audience. So we want to encourage that local audience back in, at, you know, and, and convince them that it's a safe place to be as soon as we're told it's safe to do so. And I think that's the thing here that we're all waiting, you know, for clarity on when it will be safe to do so, which clearly isn't right now. Um, but the tourism side, certainly for our waterfront venues, has been a massive part of our growth. Um, and so National Museums Liverpool would normally attract over three million visitors a year. If we get to a million this year, we'll have done quite well. Um, and that's the difference for us. And, and then how we grow that and how we build that back up is going to be key. And I think that kind of leads into the, to the stuff we're doing around the Visitor Economy Board. And, and you know, the, the kind of responsibility of the Visitor Economy Board is to advocate for these sectors at, towards the combined authority and within the LEP and, and up to national government and to work with the City Council to do that. Um, from a Liverpool point of view, but also to look at the wider city region. So, you know, the impact on areas such as Southport um, and parts of the Wirral is also quite sub substantial. And so we're looking at that and we're looking at how we can support the city's recovery plan um, and, and what it is we need to be pushing at national government. So we're all saying the same things, really. So some of the work that Stephen's been doing and Paul's been doing around uh, government initiatives that will be needed. I think what we're all clear of for the visitor economy Whilst the government intervention has been really great right now in terms of furloughing, um, and I know others are struggling with some of the systems that are not so great because they need to raise the bar on, you know, other on business rates and that kind of stuff. But the furloughing scheme has helped a lot of particularly cultural organisations. The challenge for us is once we come out of lockdown, 
as, as everybody said, there will be quite a sustained, sustained period of time where we are nowhere near the visitor figures that we'd be expecting to have, where our restaurants will be half full and where our theatres will be half full and our museums will be half full. Um, and that has a financial implication. So I think we really need to be pushing on what the, what, what the support mechanism is after the lockdown period and before we establish whatever a new normal looks like, I guess. Um, uh, Laura, you know, I think <clears throat> I think a lot of us are also concerned. I think about the the potential loss of skills and talent through this process. Uh, that you know that the 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 industry that has bought the that has kind of made the reputation of Liverpool so good has been from the people that that, that that offer those services. And you know what we you know what I think is really important is we start to think about how we make sure we don't use that lose those skills and talent that have made the place so special and what it is um that i think would be would be disastrous so i think hopefully that will be a strand that the economy board and others can start to look at yeah i mean absolutely this is a city more than more than most i guess that is absolutely built on the talent and the passion of its of its communities um, and liverpool's done a great job in bringing that together and and keeping talent here in the city um, th there is going to be a real real challenge around that there's potentially also an opportunity around that in that people will reevaluate their lives and where they are and where they want to be. And certainly, you know, we've continued with some interviewing at the moment and people are saying to us, you know, this crisis as much as anything has proved to us that we want to come back to Liverpool. You know, people who were born here, who were then living in, in London and working in London, suddenly are reevaluating and saying, actually, I'd rather be back in Liverpool. Um, I'd rather be closer to my family and back in a smaller city and not having to go on the tube every day and all of those kind of things. So I think there's, there's an opportunity for, for Liverpool and, and particularly the city region to kind of, um, to, to advertise the benefits of everything we have, the beautiful coastlines, the great outdoor spaces, the thriving city centre and all of that stuff showing that we actually have huge amounts of appeal, great universities and, and a, you know, a thriving uh, creative sector and cultural sector that can really, that talent We've seen talent thriving in the last 10 years and should be able to thrive in again moving forward. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. So uh, last but certainly not least, um, uh, Ben Williams, the, I mean, ACC, the campus at ACC, 2008 forward, it's been a, a huge success story. We've got used to welcoming large-scale conferences, exhibitions, huge concerts, great sporting events. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the landscape of life at the moment? Chris and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, like everybody else, um, it's it's difficult at the moment. Um, our initial priorities have been around um, our staff welfare and then supporting our clients. So we spend an awful lot of time working with clients, rescheduling events, um, uh, and working with them to to ensure that um, when they want to return, um, that we can host them. Um, just want to reassure everybody that you know, Liverpool's had a great offer. You know, um, Organisers, you know, both associations and professional conference organisers, they have loved hosting uh, their conferences here. People love the city offer, they love the welcome, uh, and people do want to come back, they want to return here, um, but they're going to need a lot of support and assistance to be able to do that. A lot of that is, is going to have to inevitably come from uh, central government support um, for a considerable period of time. So we, we've spent a lot of time lobbying. Um, through um, the sort of trade associations um, into the Department of Culture, Media and Sport and into, directly into central government uh, around the support we're going to need. Um, and, you know, if you think about business, tour, uh, business tourism specifically, you know, over the, you know, since 2008, it's approaching you know, two billion pounds worth of economic uh, impact to the, to the city. Uh, and that has always been based on there being funding support to incentivize organizers bring their events here it's it's a proven mechanism um subvention um and we need to ensure that we have subvention funding going forward uh, to be able to work with organizers to attract them to come back um so we're lobbying very hard for that at the moment uh, i want to give people you know some light at the end of the tunnel we are you know, we are preparing to come out of the lockdown we're already having some very positive and encouraging conversations with corporate conference organizers who want to come back and we're exploring you know, the hybrid model between a, a, a part physical and part virtual conference 
you know, recognizing that you know social distancing is is here to stay for you know probably 12 to 18 months um uh, as i say you know people want to come back we're working with them we're preparing you know, um, public confidence um you know public health and safety uh, it's going to be critical uh, and clear guidance coming out of central government and clear consistent uh, you know and honest engaging communication is also going to be um uh, crucial Okay, Ben. Thanks, thanks very much. And how does I mean, how is your I mean, how is the uh, the order book looking over the back end of the year at the moment and into next year? I mean, what is the I think a lot of the conferences I think have thankfully not cancelled. They postponed, so they will be returning back to the city. Yes, Chris. Absolutely, it's been around um, rescheduling uh, and postponing rather than cancelling. Um, it's very uh, fluid picture at the moment, uh, you know, as the situation um, evolves, you know, it, it, it changes um, by the day. Um, we initially saw everybody looking to reschedule into, you know, the last quarter of this calendar year and the first two quarters of next. It, that initially caused quite a lot of congestion. Um, we're now seeing some people looking at having to possibly reschedule again. Um, Organisations have had to furlough their staff in order to survive. So from their perspective, they, they haven't had the time or the resource to actually organise the conferences. So they're recognising they might need to give themselves more time. The concert promoters have also started recognising that, that you know, they've lost an important sales window. So uh, even, even as and when they might be able to stage concerts again, they might not have sold sufficient tickets for, for it to actually be viable. So we are starting to see things uh, push back even further but yes just to reiterate you know events are in the vast majority they're not cancelling they are looking to return um, it's just a matter of, of when uh, as we get more guidance around how and when uh, we can reopen okay great stuff okay I think uh, Bill hand you back to, to yourself yeah that's great thanks thanks for that uh, Chris, uh, and thank you for uh, all of your comp contributions. There are a number of live questions which perhaps we could uh, respond directly to. In terms of the Q&A, there's a question here uh, which actually um, concerns whether we have any views about the Atletico Madrid game going ahead in early March, impact <laughs> on the general health of the, of the city. Uh, clearly, when we look back in hindsight, perhaps it wasn't a good idea, but this said, and as opposed to Liverpool fans there, and I hold my hand up to say I'm an Evertonian, so I'm delighted it went ahead. But um, <laughs> uh, as uh, clearly the, there is, uh, we look back in hindsight, and anybody got any view on that, whether it was the right thing to do? We, we don't know until, actually, until they, they inquire, uh, the inquiry comes out to resolve that. Bill, I'll, I'll just, all I'll say is uh, we, we were actually looking after the Atletico Madrid um, directors and also I attended the game that night and I think the feeling was that it probably shouldn't have gone ahead I think the fact that there were 3,000 traveling fans and and we you know as a country hadn't come to terms with the the severity of what was happening in Spain at the time and you know I, th I think it's quite obvious you can see the spike that's happened uh, as a result of it and people are also talking about the Cheltenham Gold Cup which ironically I was also at the day after so um, whether you think you've had a mild version of it or not, I think uh, I think there'll be a lot of evidence that comes out afterwards to say that it, those two events probably accelerated the whole process. But it's it's easy in hindsight, isn't it? And we've got to look forward now. We can't we can't keep looking back. And and if if and when and shoulda shoulda coulda, you know, it's got to be about what we're doing moving forward. Yeah. Okay. A question about the recovery planning in the city. Um, and what's the structure for that plan? Well, the, the recovery planning for the city, and again, Chris and, and Claire, because you're very much leading this, I mean, uh, the person responsible for the recovery plan for the city ultimately will be Tony Reeves, the CEO and, and the mayor, but there are a number of strands. Claire, do you just want to pick that one up? Yeah, um, there's, there's three, we're, well, my, my, in my kind of our part of the world, I guess, there are three different strands so one of them is, is talking to the creative industries one of them is the cultural sector and one of them is the visitor economy sector 
And what we're kind of trying to do is create an ask for government, which is about um, one, stabilising those sectors, but then two, accelerating them. And kind of going back to my point, really, this is not just going to be a six month recovery plan. It's going to take us years and we've got to plan years ahead as well. Um, so that they're going really well. We were very quick off, off the mark with this. Um, we started straight at, well, on kind of on the Tuesday, really, after, after we were on lockdown. Um, but it's going to be tough because it's going to be hugely competitive. Every city is going to be having the same conversations. Every place that relies on tourism as its kind of way of life, really, is going to be having the same conversations, not just in the UK, but internationally. So we've got to make sure that we are telling a compelling story, which, of course, we will. Um, but we've also got to make sure that we're speaking to the right people in government and that the chief executive and obviously Joe Anderson, the mayor, are completely leading on that. And we've all got to try but I think what is very different about Liverpool I'll go back to it is we do work very well together and we're very good at a crisis so actually the sectors have come out and, and some of the ideas that are coming through are just brilliant. Great thanks. Claire while you're still there I mean there's a further question about the cruise industry and a specific one about the cruise terminal we know that uh, funding is is ready for that planning is, is uh, again has been passed for it and a cruise terminal was due to start on site later this year um, the question is, should it be mothballed or postponed? Uh, I think you've, I think it's very, times like this are really hard on there. And I've, I've lived here for the last 20 years. And sometimes you can, if, if we said that about Liverpool 1, it would never have happened. So I think we've just got to, you know, as Paul said, be looking ahead. Cruise liners will, cruise liners are a huge, huge international business. They will find a way through this. Um, they've got a huge amount, especially of American money behind them. Um, they, they will find a way through and people will cruise, I would imagine, in very, very different ways. There'll be great minds thinking about how they do that. So for us as a city, the amount of money the cruise liners bring in, as we all know, is huge. So we've got no intention at the moment of mothballing anything or backtracking on any of those ambitions that we have as a city because we've got to keep our foot on the gas, even through the times that we're going through and through the hard times we're all, you know, everyone's going through, through, through health, through loved ones and through our jobs, but we can't stop thinking forward for the next generation of the city. Yeah, thanks Claire. I mean, that's, that's the key point, isn't it? And the city has uh, gone through tremendous regeneration over the last 30 years. We've got, we've got such a buoyant visitor economy there, which is why we've got to, we've got to come out to the blocks um, really quickly and, and get a response that will bring people back to the city. And part of that is about reassurance and there was one in the chat uh, was a question earlier about whether we as a city can build on the fact of our history around public health and obviously mm -hmm. we know with Dr Duncan and the first public health officer and, and actually it's part of our forming uh, our planning is about Liverpool is the safe city to come back for because bringing people back into a visitor economy that requires close contact and bringing people back into a city will require reassurance and that reassurance will be first and foremost if people think they that their health is being protected sorry do you want bill do you want i suppose whether chris from a marketing point of view how do we use health as as a marketing tool for us well, i think it's very important that we'll create demand through confidence uh, and uh, if, if uh, and I'm going back to what I said earlier, I think if our, if our local population feel confident about entering the city and entering the venues of the city, uh, then that will start to build uh, demand and it will start to build that confidence base that, that we need. And I think there is no two doubts, I think Paul picked it up earlier, that some of our population will be, will be you know, desperate to get back into, into the city way of life and, and some will be very concerned about doing that, particularly the more vulnerable. Um, so I think I think we will we will we will find in that space that health is going to be really important, um, and uh, Liverpool has a great reputation in that, as as has previously been said. And I think if we get that health narrative right, and uh, we can give advice to our businesses, which I think is really important about what they need to do to prepare for that, and that's about interpreting national guidelines at local level. I uh, think we've got some really great expertise in Liverpool City Council through the Director of Public Health, Matt Ashton, to help with that process that will be critical to start that confidence rebuilding because I think every city, every uh, business will want to basically give that impression that when you cross over our threshold, you will be looked after you. We have put mechanisms in place that will help build the audiences. Great. Thanks, Chris. Donna, you lead the, the marketing group within Elven. Would you like to come in at that point? Yeah, I think um, 
Bill, one of the listening to both Claire and um, Chris there, that what we need to look at post um, this phase of coronavirus, uh, what are the big themes that are going to come out? And the overriding one um, is that that thriving sense of, of community. Um, you know, we've seen some huge community efforts, just generally the, the, the public staying home, staying safe and people supporting the NHS is the overriding one. Um, but Liverpool is well known for having a thriving community spirit. Um, and I think it now is working with those communities to develop some newfound partnerships. Um, I think that will man manifest itself in, in different ways. We've already spoken about rebuilding from um, the core. There are huge numbers within our, our city region who won't have discovered our museums and our, our galleries and the local places of interest. And I think that they um, will really want to get out in a safe um, and well-managed way um, to support Liverpool. I think that there's immense pride within the city. I think its people will play a pivotal role in getting the region uh, the city region and the city centre back on its feet and I think that knowing that there is this um, reluctance there will be a reluctance from for people to travel too far afield in the initial weeks and months as we move out of uh, lockdown cities and communities as Claire said will look to rebuild locally first but I think that deep sense of pride and that culture that unites um, people across our city and our city region is absolutely fundamental and I think if there's any city that is going to be um, in a great place to rebuild itself with its people and with its communities then that's Liverpool. Thanks Donna. I think Paul you had a point to make. You just don't mute yourself. Am I on mute sorry? No, no, you're, no you're fine no. thanks Paul. Yeah. No, it was just following on from the, the, the health and the building of confidence. You know, it, it's quite right. There are going to be two tribes of people, that, you know, the, the ones who are the demob happy, who can't wait to get out and go crazy and, and, and go to the bars, go to the restaurants. And they're going to be that, that other sector that, um, who, are, who are very nervous and, and need that confidence. And I think if we can mobilise that tribe by saying, you know, we're not just going to listen to what Matt Ashton says, we're going to go above and beyond that and go the extra mile with our, with our uh, you know, sort of confidence building uh, health-wise, I, I think you'll see a lot more people return during that period. And I think it, it's, it's exactly what Chris says. It's, it's quality assurance, but in a very different way now, isn't it? So yeah. that, that's just all I wanted to add on that. Thanks, Paul. Um, we also had a number of questions that were emailed in earlier. I just want to pick up those that haven't been answered. If we can just pick some of those up while we're speaking and while everybody's here now. But just one question, though. Um, do, we, do we, as a panel, believe lockdown will be reduced next week or we expect another extension? Well, clearly, uh, nobody knows and nobody can answer that. All we know is that lockdown is being governed by the scientists and the public health uh, England, and lockdown has been there for a particular reason, which is to maintain control over this pandemic. The big worry is that if we lock, if we open up too early and too quickly, then the pandemic will come back and we'll have a second wave. Uh, and that's part of the thinking behind this. All I would say, and I don't know if anybody else in the panel has got anything different to say, is that as soon as it, we are able to open up the economy, the government wants to open up the economy. If you just do the numbers on uh, what it's costing the economy at this moment in time, clearly government wants to open up as quickly as possible. But at the centre of all of this is about um, the health and the health of the nation and those health of those individuals and all of all our own health, which is why we're doing what we're doing. Don't know anybody else has got anything else on that? It differs from my thinking. No. All right. uh, we've had a number of questions in, particularly around about funding, Chris. Do you want to come back in, Chris Brown, around funding for the DMO, uh, particularly this COVID DMO relief? but also about how we get funding into um, destination marketing. I know before, the, before COVID-19 was ever heard of, we were working on ways of bringing funding in so we could support the destination marketing and also the business tourism, and the whole of this, um, the whole of the sector. Um, Chris, do you want to come in on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be very interesting this because I think we've probably spent the last number of years trying to uh, replace public sector funding with private sector funding uh, as that reduced. And I think coming out of COVID, we're going to have to flip that completely on its head. Um, the, the amount of uh, private sector money that will be available to support initiatives will be, will be vastly reduced because quite likely they need to do that to build their own business. So we need to, and I think it's a point that Claire mentioned through the recovery plan, we need to build a coherent case uh, for public resources. And we need those also coming from our own city region, our own CA as well, to begin to replace some of that private sector work with public sector money to, to, drive, uh, to drive the next wave of, uh, of positioning ourselves. Because I can guarantee you that's what every other that's what every other country around the world will be starting to do because that competitive nature will be very strong. We need to be ready for that and, and we need to be prepared for that. But I think to feel that we can go with the same model we went previously, that we were trying to move to lower public sector, higher private sector is uh, not a model I, I believe that we can go forward with for the next year or maybe in the next couple of years. And we're going to have to make that case very, very strongly because every other sector will, will I think, have similar, similar challenges. In the same way, we've got to influence, uh, you know, through DCMS, through Visit Britain, Visit England, to make sure that resources that are coming forward, particularly domestically, are ideally devolved down to local consortia, uh, whether that be the north, whether it be the northwest, whether it be core cities, whether it may ever be, uh, to make sure that that money is spent wisely uh, at a local level, because I think the local uh, organisations know a bit more about that. From the, from the point of view of, 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 of marketing Liverpool, um, you know, our, our, our funding approach on that is that, is that we, we, we fundamentally know that our private sector income, which has been the mainstay of the activity we've undertaken, will be very different in, in next year. And, and we need to find innovative and clever ways of, of dealing with that situation. Uh, and we're having those conversations with national and local government about that as, as an opportunity, but that is no different to any, any destination in the UK at the moment. Chris, there's a, there's a question about whether we should set up a Northern Powerhouse DMO uh, combining Liverpool and Manchester. Well, I think well, clearly we need to concentrate on Liverpool um, and Liverpool city region as the key areas that we're working at this moment in time. But you work across the north anyway and across through the core cities uh, lobbying government anyway, don't you? Oh, it is. I mean, if the one thing that the Northern Powerhouse has told us in one respect is that if you work collegiately, work collaboratively and you work coordinated, then uh, five voices is better than one. So I think what we have been looking to do, we work very regularly with Manchester, as we do with Birmingham, as we do with Leeds, uh, you know, to look at opportunities. But clearly we are we are very conscious within that, that we are, we're, we're, we're protecting the brand of Liverpool in the, in the industry of Liverpool. But there are certain subject matters and, and funding is one of them where working together is sometimes better than, than, than working apart. But uh, I think uh, we will do that, but we'll also look to develop our own initiatives for Liverpool itself. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions that are still there at the moment. A uh, couple of the statements. One of them is a question about what are we doing to support the visitor economy in terms of um, promoting the, the vouchers, you know, the pay it forward. Uh, well, we have uh, and are working with a national campaign for crowdfunding and pay it forward. And maybe so if you go onto the bid website on that, you can see what we're doing with that. Um, and there are a number of businesses that are already using that. So pick up at liverpoolbidcompany.com website, uh, have a look at the Pay It Forward campaign and, and promote that as much as possible because that's clearly one of the other ways of getting cash into businesses is about paying it forward, about people buying vouchers and, and contributing to business to keep them going. So please do look at that. There's a number of initiatives. And again, they're on the Marketing Liverpool and Liverpool Bid websites. I'm just going to bring it to a conclusion, actually, because it is one o'clock. Uh, so just a couple of comments. One of them was about sport and leisure driving city engagement for, uh, and about being healthy at home. And again, we can use sports events to spread spending on culture also. Um, it's a key for, for the city uh, that culture and sport, are, it's all part of our DNA. And, and we will use every bit of our DNA to get our city back uh, as soon as we can do. And, and again, one, one final point is about Liverpool City region businesses shopping locally and including local businesses in our supply chain. And again, that's all part of the recovery. So I just say a big thank you for everybody to do today. Um, we all need to obviously continue to push 
uh, and stay safe, stay at home, protect the NHS, and that's what we're doing. Uh, and obviously give a big thank you to all the people that work in that sector. But uh, clearly we are working very hard on the visitor economy to protect the visitor economy so that we could come out of this pandemic whenever that is. And hopefully we pray that it is sooner rather than later. But um, at such time we come out of it, we will be in a position that we can start roaring forward as this city will always do. So thanks everybody for today. Uh, we will offer this again in the near future if the panelists uh, certainly are available for it. I'm sure you will be. And if the participants are happy for that, if you've got any further questions, do mail them in. And you can use either of our uh, Marketing Liverpool or ourselves to uh, respond to. And we'll see you all soon. Stay safe.